I fell upon the fiends of Thanalan, keening my body through the gladiatorial arts of Uldar and immersing myself in their world, a world that I see now to be a far cry from its veneer. And with my newfound determination, my reputation quickly grew. I had not been long in Horizon before impressing a young officer of the Brass Blades named Fufulpa, who engaged me to see a missive into the hands of his former captain stationed at Lost Hope. And what a fitting name for that place. This Lost Hope is but a circle of tattered tents shading Alamegan refugees in rags, and a few brass blades that have been demoted and reassigned under suspicion of possessing a moral compass. This former Captain Leofric bid me leave lest the association do me harm, but rumours of a nearby gang of bandits that had been preying on the camp piqued my interest. The leader of these overzealous potatoes called himself a baron, but he was no less brittle than the rest. Once I was certain that the refugees could sleep easy, Leofric sent me back to Horizon with a curious ornamental dagger of some symbolic value to Fufulpa and his fellows. Despite his disenchantment with the Blade's syndicate patrons, Leofric seemed to have some respect and hope for the lad. Fufulpa had no shortage of work for me around the footfalls, and I was surprised to find the coast of Thanalan so wet. I found more desperate poverty under the syndicate's rug at the fishing village of Crescent Cove, and assisted the villagers to make provisions for the ossuary thaumaturges inspecting the ruins whom these poor and strained people were expected to accommodate. Hearing while I was there tales of unregulated banditry and corruption among the brass blades. A villager observed some unashamed bandits discussing plans to trade for stolen Nashakite. The Fulpa overheard the girl disclosing this to me and ran off to notify his captain Baldwin before Marilda could finish that it was precisely this captain himself who was conspiring with the outlaws. I caught up with the lad as he stumbled upon a meeting between another self-impressed Potato Baron and Baldwin whom claimed to work under the authority of a familiar name, Lord Lolorito. The name of that cretin has not dissuaded me before and I saw no harm whatsoever in pounding the most senseless. Leofric too had heard of the meeting and arrived to apprehend the captain. It seems that Baldwin had been merely throwing Lolorito's name around to drive his own agenda. And although Leofric insisted that there are plenty among the blades that share the integrity of young Fufulpa, this incident did nothing in my eyes to redeem their ranks, nor their puppet master. Fufulpa himself was promoted to acting captain of Horizon, and I suppose that is something. Fufulpa sent me back to Uldar and Mistress Mamodi as part of the investigation into the corruption of former Captain Baldwin, and he had apparently been corresponding with the Sultan Sworn Awin in the capital. Mamodi seemed to think there was something much bigger going on. The crown of Sultana Nanamo Unamo had been stolen, and this Awin was guarding it the night that it had disappeared. Mamodi suspected that these outlaw partners of Baldwin were the guilty party, and that this letter Fufulpa had discovered was the key to the mystery. Mamodi had me confront Awin and render whatever assistance I was able. It turned out that the man was well out of his depth. The letter was, in fact, a note of ransom, and Alween intended to acquiesce to the thieves' demands. I followed the young Sultan Sworn to the unholy air in central Thanalan. I did not expect the exchange to go smoothly, yet, nor did I expect quite what I found beneath that plateau. The outlaws, garbed in regal purple, received their compensation, and Alween had no inkling as to what he had just handed them. Their leader Garibald referred to the trader's spurn, and I am no scholar, but this object, this substance, whatever it is, is known by historians as that which destroyed the Sildir, transforming their ranks and civilians alike into mindless, restless undead. Garibald and his men moved to engage us, but an old potato man caught me by surprise. Papashan, in the mantle of a paladin, broke the crest of the bank with a dozen Sultan Swan and charged at the outlaws. Garibald was not going to fall easy, and as we turned the tide of battle, we saw him do something terrible. He called forth a vicious void scent of the same species I had fought alongside Thancred beneath the Sultan Tree. I cut it down, and the Sultan Swan hurried off in pursuit of the surviving bandits, but something stayed me. I felt something in the air, the same texture as 
that at the piercing whisper at the Sildir ruins. As if heeding my wordless challenge, a masked man in midnight robes crept forth. With a flourish, he filled the air with noxious dark and dragged a hulking gargoyle from me somewhere. But I had already found that demons bleed, and I had all but broken the creature before Thancred appeared to take the kill. We beat down the Shadow Man, and as the darkness cleared, Thancred revealed the figure to be a servant of Asius, some kind of formidable evil. I had not forgotten the promise I had made to myself to extract some answers from this rogue, but he anticipated me. One of the gifted, he called me. He was referring to my dreams and visions. As he left, I noticed another crystal beside the fallen Asia. Not one of light, but of darkness, and it shattered and dissolved before me. I reported to the heart of the Sworn in Uldar, to which Papashan and Alwin were already returned. Papashan told me that which I had already guessed, that he was once himself a serving Sultan Sworn, but that even now he served as an escort to the Sultana whenever she was traveling outside of the city. It struck me then that the girl I had rescued under the Sultan Tree several days ago was no noble child but Ulnamo herself. The Sultana and her champion Rabon al-Din honored me with a ring of service and spoke of a banquet. It seemed strange to me that the Sultanate would so honor one so new to these lands for apprehending thieves and conspirators, but I realized with some regret that the allies of these true patriots of Uldar must be few and failing. I accepted the accolades, if only that it might further acquaint me with the general. He is a man of legend across Eorzea for his passion and ruthlessness, clawing his way from poverty to the syndicate and right hand of the Sultana through the virtue of his blades. And in person he seemed to match this military reputation with a wealth of honor and sincerity. He is familiar and sympathetic with the plight of Thanalan's poor and hungry, no friend of the monetarists and a man that I would be proud to fight beside. Rabon also sensed the light of the crystal within me and asked about my visions of Heidel. He offered me an answer to this puzzle of mine. He thinks me to be like the absent champions of Kartano, the warriors of light. As he thought back to that eve of the calamity, his focus dragged me into another vision, and I realize now that these things I have been seeing are not dreams or symbols. They are very real. this day. You know this to be true. Let us not sacrifice lives in vain. The adventurers fight bravely, but to no avail. Let them withdraw, and let us be the ones to stand with Louis Soir. Maelstrom units are commanded to fall back effective immediately. 
Give the foreign levy priority. Let the main host cover their retreat and bring up the rear. Damn it! Relay the order. All flames are to withdraw. I don't care if our link cells are useless. The outcome of this battle was long since decided. When I awoke in my in-room, the sense of purpose I had found building after each vision had escalated once again, and Mamodi relayed to me instructions from the general. I have clearly made some impression upon Aldin. He has given me an airship pass and wants me to act as his personal envoy in relaying a missive to the Alliance city-states regarding services to commemorate the fifth anniversary of the Battle of Kartano. I believe that I may be finally on the path to my true calling. But while I am back in Limsa Laminta, there is something I feel I must do. I thought it would be prudent to learn the local martial traditions of Uldar, and the techniques of the gladiators have served me well, but my arms are missing a certain weight and impact. It's time to fetch my axe.